research tell us about values connecting heritage conservation with waste? Um, so just to introduce this session, um, uh, this got me thinking in new ways. And it's interesting, one of the things that I think many of us working in the field of heritage conservation have been quite preoccupied with for quite some time is basically existing codified definitions of heritage, of heritage value, uh, of how we define the role of heritage in society. Um, and the fact that these very codified definitions, uh, which have been in place for a very long time, are really increasingly at odds with the way that we understand the world um, and societal concerns these days regarding uh, greenhouse gas emissions, climate change, and sustainable development. And in particular, something I would flag um, are our curatorial processes in heritage conservation. You know, where we place emphasis um, almost exclusively on the oldest, um, the prettiest, the best, uh, with the implication that basically the newer, the more ordinary, and the more common have little or no value. And so what this session, I think, serves to demonstrate in a really interesting way is, is the power and the potential of actually reframing future directions um, in heritage conservation and in how we look at these current challenges um, by basically examining this intersection of two areas of study, two separate disciplines that would have traditionally been seen in opposition to one another, um, namely waste and heritage. So I find this, this has certainly got me thinking in new ways. Um, the other thing I flag is um, uh, basically um, I think how exciting it is to see evidence of the momentum of this intersection between uh, waste and heritage. And what I just mentioned quickly, I asked the three presenters um, in an email if they actually knew each other, uh, if they had met one another before, and they mentioned an anecdote that about a year ago they had been at a conference where they met each other for the first time at a conference, and in fact all three of them discovered that uh, they were all uh, in the field of heritage conservation or in the state's historic preservation, um, and that all three of them were in fact working on their master's dissertations. Um, on subjects that related to exactly this intersection um, of, of waste and heritage, so theses about deconstruction and material reuse, and they've since, I guess, kept in touch, and what's really exciting is that these three women are now uh, our panelists today, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce our three presenters, um, all three of whom are scholars and now recent graduates, um, whose research focuses on different aspects of this notion of value um, at the intersection of waste and heritage. What I'll do is I'll just introduce all three uh, very quickly now at the beginning, and then of course, like the last session, we'll have time for uh, questions at the end. So first of all, Alison Kriva is a recent graduate of the Heritage Conservation Program at Carleton University. Um, whose presentation and research are informed uh, by two internships that she completed over the course of her MA, um, one in Toronto at TRA Architect of my firm, and the other in Brussels with the deconstruction architecture firm uh, Rotor. Um, the, uh, another pre a presenter is Tina McCarthy, who recently completed her master's degree at the Boston Architectural College's Master of Design Studies in Historic Preservation, and in addition to her academic work, um, she is a skilled historic window restorer and recently built a tiny, tiny house set of salvaged materials. And then um, our third presenter is Alison Arlotta, who recently completed her master's degree in the Historic Preservation Program at Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture Planning and preservation, and her thesis, in fact, uh, won the 
Outstanding Thesis Award. And I should say, I think uh, Tina and Allison have actually uh, decided to switch the order of their presentation. So it'll be Allison Kriba, uh, Allison Arwana, and then you'll hear from Tina McCarthy. Okay. Thank you. Um, very proud and, and honored to join and follow um, everybody who is who is presenting here today, and also to be joined by uh, Allison and Tina again. So it's a great great time. Um, uh, this section is actually going to sort of provide quite a nice transition from the earlier session on site lessons. Um, my presentation is going to focus on the concept of site thinking um, as a way of situating an analysis of deconstruction and reuse processes within specific spatial contexts. In their book, Site Matters, Design Concepts, Histories, and Strategies, Carol Burns and Andrea Kahn introduced the concept of site thinking as the means by where, where sorry, whereby <laughs> exchanges are construed and comprehended. As a form of knowing, site thinking is concretely situated, more interactive than abstract, less concerned with semantic no content of knowledge than with a concern for relationships amongst the knowers and the known. Site thinking understands knowledge as, an embedded, as embedded within specific ways of engaging with the world. So for me, this concept is really important because it places an emphasis on interactions and relationships and modes of engagement and it provides a methodology for dealing with existing materials that um, is in line with the same questioning of the architectural premise of Terranellius, which is what we are here doing. So in line with this existing, with the existing materials and structures which we are, whose values we are questioning today in this present dialogue, I also want to suggest in this presentation that we should also consider the site as an actor and an indicator in the value transformation that occurs in deconstruction and reuse. So I'll be doing this through two case studies, uh, the two sort of recent projects I've been working on, uh, and which uh, involve two specific sites. Uh, one is uh, Honest Ed's in Mervish Village in Toronto, um, and the second is the broader context of Brussels, Belgium, from which I just returned two days ago. Uh, in both cases, my research me methodology involved embedded investigations, where I took an active role in not only investigating the physical form of the site, but also the various intersecting relationships, perspectives, and products. In this way, I choose to define uh, the site not only as a specific bounded geographical area, but also a reflection of the broader socio-spatial contexts which enable processes of transformation. So my uh, major research project uh, here uh, considered the role that the site plays in conserving, adapting, and transforming the physical and associated values um, of salvage building materials through processes of demolition and deconstruction. And I'm going to join demolition and deconstruction together often in this statement because both were at, at play in, on this site and um, as one will learn, they are often not, it's neither, sometimes it's not one or the other, they are um, sometimes happen as it was the case in this site. So for those who don't know Honest Ed's, uh, it was a large uh, discount department store located in the heart of Toronto at uh, the intersection of Bathurst and Bloor and has a pretty classic story or romantic one uh, which started from modest beginnings um, um, and the store expanded over several decades to eventually span the entire block. And during this period of expansion, the uh, store's owner, Ed Mervish, also purchased the row of houses uh, that went uh, south from the, from the original site. And uh, he, uh, Mervish, converted the houses into artist studios and commercial spaces uh, and galleries, and this became known as, Ed, of, as Mervish Village. 
And together, these two entities of Honest Ed's and Mervish Village uh, became recognized as a, as a unique and very celebrated enclave in Toronto. After his death um, and under new ownership, um, Honest Ed's and Mervish Village is now a development project uh, involving multiple forms of conservation, including demolition, deconstruction, rehabilitation, building relocation, new construction, and the reuse of salvage building materials. So of course, super fascinating, and uh, the subject of my research, um, which took place for se over several months, from September to April. And during this period, the site underwent several significant changes, most notably the demolition of Honest Ed's. And throughout this time, I was granted access to the site, and in several uh, multiple day-long visits, I collected photos, fragments, and accounts of the site from the laborers who worked there. While there, I also found myself entranced by the methodical movements of the machines and also the materials, um, which themselves seemed to convey um, new understandings of the, of the site's uh, construction history, but also its subsequent unbuilding. So in addition to providing a theoretical, historical, and technical account of the procedures that I observed on site, the project that I did explored both who and what participates in projects, in processes of demolition and deconstruction by investigating the spaces and the materials which influence these uh, procedures. So, like many sites, the quality of existing materials is entangled with complex cultural associations. One um, uh, illustration of this is the extraction of asbestos with the retention of uh, heritage objects. Both are done with extreme care, uh, with attention to where the particles go and tracking of materials, operations, transportation. Um, and they also present a very interesting parallel to consider the difference between what is conserved and what is discarded. They have an almost inverted um, but also parallel trajectory. Um, another illustration of the complex associations that are tied to these things was the uh, um, disassembly of the signage which wrapped the building. And this was the most iconic part of the structure, and there had been five signs. The first was dismantled with um, the intention of restoring and reinstalling it elsewhere in the city, but the subsequent four ones were sort of um, uh, torn down in different ways. And on one case in particular, on a very cold day in, or a very cold series of days in December, I watched as two uh, laborers in an overhead um, scissor lift uh, sawed through the sign from the back and sort of carried um, or sort of tossed these, these fragments of the sign down into the rubble below. But what was interesting was that in the subsequent days following, images of those fragments started appearing on, online, um, sort of revived and, and relit again some of the original bulbs still working. So this really illustrated the sort of the tension and the power of this material to um, almost defy the, 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 the actions that had been sort of carried out on it. And of course, I was also very interested in the structural um, portions, the concrete, uh, the steel, and the historic timber. Um, I observed how it was sort of categorized into these, these uh, material categories and shipped into different uh, places, and eventually taken, taken off site. But what was also interesting was how um, one crew of, of, of one small company that was interested in the historic timber managed to convince the contractor to set aside some of the timber on some of the, uh, 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 some of the uh, commercial buildings um, else elsewhere on site. And, th and this was captured uh, by the local news and uh, subsequently became a, a, par a celebra celebrated part of the story of Honest Ed's and its continuing legacy. So these three... Um, examples sort of illustrate the complex ties of the physical with the cultural and um, for me I was very interested to uh, illuminate these these values but how do I how do we measure them how do we explore the question of what values are within this um, 
sort of complex context. So I relied on two uh, studies to, uh, to reference the, the measure of values. One was Cedric Price's McAppy project, um, which he uh, conducted in 1973 in the wake of Britain's first national construction workers' strike. And as an architect, he had been commissioned by the McAlpine Construction Company to broadly assess the health of its construction sites with the aim of improving industrial relations, maintaining standards, and importantly, cultivating morale across the workforce. Through an interdisciplinary study, um, Price's final proposal was a series of infrastructural interventions which drew attention to previously overlooked connection between the organization of the building site and the emotional state of the workers. In particular, McAppy demonstrated not only how socio-spatial conditions are linked, but suggested that an attention to the felt aspects of the building site may influence the quality of the final product. And I think this is exactly what you were saying, Jerry. Here, the connection between happiness, health, and health are very uh, tied in with the conversations about uh, safeguarding and conservation that are a part of the language we use in heritage. The second model that I use to evaluate values um, was um, Nikki Gregson's follow the thing methodology. Proposing that value exists in an open loop system where objects eventually start to come apart economically, physically, symbolically, and socially, Gregson's practice of following things demonstrates the degree to which tra uh, value transformation is contingent on an existing established social and structural infrastructures. So I employed this, this approach as well, uh, mapping uh, where the items from Honest Ed's ended up. Um, I looked at the site of asbestos, uh, the asbestos dump, um, where fragments of the, of the steel uh, went to, and also found out where some of those secret uh, stolen signs ended up as well. Um, so um, employing this approach, uh, sorry, drawing attention to the potential social and environmental legacies of the materials in their second lives, I suggest, opens up a dialogue about the ways in which they continue to perform elsewhere. So we start to think about them in other places. Finally, as both a place and a process, I suggest that the demolition and deconstruction site itself might also be considered a heritage site as was demonstrated by the over 27,000 photos uh, posted to Instagram over the course of my research alone, the site, it became obvious that the site was itself a, a destination, um, a place that was implicitly recognized um, um, in its moment of de destruction as a defining feature in its overall story. Um, so as such, um, the site and its remnant materials and related geographies represents not only a loss, but also is commemorated through ongoing processes of transformation. So I had basically just handed in this, this project when I immediately got on a plane to Brussels. Um, because I had uh, got myself an uh, internship with Rotor, who is an art and architect uh, yeah, architecture collective uh, based in Brussels, Belgium, uh, who specialize in building deconstruction. They do a range of things, including research, architectural design, um, and also they have their own deconstruction firm. So, um, in addition to this, I was also awarded a, a research uh, scholarship and to pursue a project which I called What Have We Got Here? A Study of Heritage Value and Building Deconstruction and Material Reuse Within a Belgian Context. Um, and I was working in the, uh, also in the Department of Architectural Engineering at the Vrie Universitat Bruxelles. So for this project, I had proposed an embedded research methodology supplement where I would supplement my work at Rotor with a scholarly investigation of the specific place-based conditions which support the development of a burgeoning deconstruction uh, and reuse sector. So immersed in this way, I produced several outputs. Um, some of them are on the table over there. One is a book of collages, and the other is an experimental essay that I wrote called uh, Somewhere in Between. 
Uh, somewhere in between, it combines photography and personal narrative as well as academic research to reflect on the transformation of existing architectural material and land values. So it starts uh, with a story of telling from uh, about my journey from the northeastern uh, district of Skadbeck to the south, uh, sorry, yeah, northeastern to the southwestern uh, region of Anderlecht, um, where on my daily journey to work, I would pass uh, the main uh, uh, train station, the Gare du Nord, uh, then uh, a series of office, uh, modern office towers. I would cross a canal over the bridge and encounter a series of former industrial sites, including the former Citroën garage, uh, which had only just recently opened its doors as the new Centre Pompidou in Brussels. So taking note uh, not only of the structures assembled along the canal, but also the material found in it, pro provided me with a unique understanding of the kind of urban metabolism uh, active in Brussels. The canal, in fact, is essential to understanding the architectural etymology because it has long been used and is continued to be used to transport raw materials as well as recycled uh, materials through the city. The most intriguing part of my journey, however, occurred when I diverged from the canal and rode towards uh, Rotor's site. It was along this stretch that I encountered uh, um, strange configurations of waste. Using these sculptural assemblages as a conceptual pivot point, I considered the relationship between these collections and the materials gathered at, uh, nearby at Rotor's warehouse. It seemed to, clear to me that although they have undergone very different processes to arrive at this very similar location, these materials shared something fundamental in common, which was that they all occupied this sort of liminal position between either geographic, cultural, or, ec or economic territories. So interested in this liminal position in the material's life cycle, I embarked on a macro and micro scale spatial, socio-spatial analysis to explore the roles of these spaces, liminal spaces, in past and ongoing development in the city. Uh, my conceptual grounding for this uh, investigation uh, emerged from the French landscape architect named Gilles Clement, who in his essay, Working With and Never Against Nature, introduces the concept of tiers passage, or the third landscape. He describes it as left behind urban or rural sites, transitional spaces, neglected land, uh, but also roadside shores, railway embankments. According to Clement, these overlooked, discarded spaces are valuable because they cultivate diversity. It is precisely because they are overlooked that they are inadvertent conservation areas. So linking land use with the values of the materials found there, um, I also discovered another project entitled Building Brussels, which offered an exemplary model on how to read these relationships between the materials and the site connecting the production of the urban fabric to the flow of construction materials and the evolution of small material suppliers and contracting firms. This project uses GIS mapping techniques to layer data relating to the location, typology, um, activity, and historical period. Within this, the research uh, team has begun to identify patterns between specific architectural composition of small, small businesses and the larger geospatial economic conditions in which they exist. Um, playing with these various combinations, this methodology enables a unique reading of otherwise unseen connections. Beyond this, uh, the Building Brussels project also suggested that the movement and transformation of materials are linked to broader conservation of the broader conservation of industrial heritage. In particular, uh, it can be seen to contribute to a form of Bau culture, a German word meaning building culture, um, uh, which was recently codified by the heritage uh, in the heritage community in uh, Davos, Switzerland, in January of this year and where it was defined as an aspect of cultural diversity which holistically embraces every human activity that changes the built environment. 
Bow culture refers to both detailed construction methods and large-scale transformations and developments, embracing traditional and local building skills as well as innovative techniques. So complementing the Building Brussels uh, project with almost a poetic in inversion, another project currently happening in Brussels is Le Bâti Bruxellois, Source de Nouveaux Matériaux, uh, or BBSM, which translates into B Brussels Buildings, a Source of New Materials. This is a long-term study which seeks to redefine existing buildings as valuable resources working to address questions of resource management and ongoing industrial activity, as well as wider sustainable development goals uh, outlined by the EU. The premise of BBSM emerges from a fundamental, uh, fundamental recognition of the value of previously overlooked materials. In this way, the BBSM initiative analyzes the urban metabolism of the construction industry and, re and reads uh, existing uh, structures not only for their potential contribution to future construction projects, but also envisions them as a form of um, environmental conservation. But it also what, uh, supports this notion of bow culture. Uh, participating in early phases of this project, Rotor couldn't, uh, uh, conducted historical research which revealed a tradition of deconstruction and reuse in Brussels. Further, beyond, uh, beyond this, uh, they in 2016 started the Opal uh, Opalis, which is an ongoing initiative which maps and inventories reclamation businesses currently operating in Belgium. This demonstrates that not only was there, is there a historic context uh, in this place, but uh, also a living, physical, economic, and social landscape for deconstruction. Um, be, there's also another project called the Canal Plan, which I was going to say more about, but um, they've identified six uh, areas of interest in this sort of planning strategy. One of them is uh, the, the identification of derelict plots as a, as a resource in the city, but I will, not, I will skip that. And just sort of um, offer a, a little bit of a conceptual grounding, which I um, got from Melanie Vanderhoorn's Indispensable Eyesores, where she mixes uh, Michael Thompson's famous rubbish theory with Kevin Hetherington's theory of first and second burials to explain the factors which influence the transformation of an undesired building into um, a valued site. What is of note in Vanderhoorn's explanation is the importance of a liminal period in which activity stops and the structure becomes the focus of dialogue and assessment. While she suggests that this phase may be distinguished uh, physically um, by the installation of hoarding, I would also propose that we think about other more abstract compositions, potentially this uh, combination of um, discarded materials or salvage yards, as also an illustration of this sort of momentary lapse in development. Further still, Vanderhoorn proposes that some alternatives to the burial method, a uh, metaphor, offering notions of resuscitation and reincarnation for instances where materials are not removed but retained on site. So ultimately this theory uh, aligns very well with the story that I have woven on my bicycle um, and it demonstrates how liminal periods in a materials life cycle manifest both physically and culturally. Uh, and in this sense these places and moments in between are also important in the transformation of associated values and as Clement suggests, uh, essential to cultivating and conserving diversity. And that is it for me.